Now, Brian Eno recently released his first album of songs for over 30 years. Another Day on Earth is quite a turn-up for a man whose career has been defined by instrumental music of various kinds, so we thought we ought to go and have a quiet word. I tracked Eno down to his rather lovely new house in the Oxfordshire countryside, where afternoon tea was served in the conservatory by one of his daughters as we looked out on a walled lawn the size of a small cricket pitch. It's a long way down We're leaning over the side Far beyond now The days go down in turn Brian, your albums are always responses, in a sense, to things that are happening. They have a context. What is the context to an album about songs? Why songs now? I noticed that I was listening to songs a lot over the last few years, whereas for quite a long period I had stopped listening to songs, and I, I had become more interested in just music. I started listening to songs again, I, I'm, I suppose partly because I'd worked with some great songwriters and was starting to appreciate that talent again. Could you just tell us who you think are great? Who, give us some examples well, of great Bowie, songwriters. David Bowie is a great songwriter. Bono is a great songwriter. Several others as well. Well, Paul Simon I've just been working with as well. One of the greatest songwriters, I think. So I'd started to think about songs again and how songs get to be the shape that they are and wondering whether they needed to be that kind of shape. So I, I just started thinking about songs and wondering whether they could come in other shapes and sizes. Now this has been a thread through my work for quite a long time, trying to do things with voices and with text and sense. And I suppose that line of experiments reawakened. So in a lot of these songs I'm doing things to the voice that abstract it from a normal human voice, for example, on bottom liners and uh, the song called And Then So Clear. Those are both sort of, they're my voice originally, but they're resynthesized to become another kind of being. And Then So Clear is a sort of strange, androgynous, <laughs> genderless creature, angelic creature, I guess. So I'm using devices that people normally use to correct mistakes, but I'm trying to use them as, as what they are and make a point of them. love singing you've always loved singing I do love it yeah I, lo I love it so much that I even have an a cappella group and we sing 
once a week. Just for fun? Yeah. We'll never do it for any other reason. I think I read somewhere that you said, in relation to this album, that you thought lyric writing was a particularly tricky challenge now. Can you elaborate on that? It's tricky because it's the only thing to do with music that hasn't been made easier, technically. <laughs> um, for example, it's, it's quite easy to throw together a fairly convincing piece of music from stuff you can buy in any music store. You know, samplers and libraries of sounds and software synths that... You know, you hold down one note and you've got a whole career as an ambient artist. Now. And let's not forget generative music, which well, exactly. has been an enthusiasm of yours. Yes, exactly. So there are lots of ways of approaching making music that have made it much, much easier to... It doesn't mean you'll make better music, but you can make pretty presentable music very easily. Just as, you know, you can imagine the effect on portrait painting when the camera appeared suddenly, if likenesses was what you were interested in, there was a much easier way of doing it. You know, so suddenly the world of painting changed overnight in terms of what its priority job was. It changed overnight with the invention of the camera. Well, a similar thing has happened with music, I think, but nothing like it has happened with lyrics. Lyric writing is still, apart from what's going on in rap and hip-hop, Lyric writing is still really pretty much what it was 400 years ago, you know. <laughs> There's not much difference. And there are very few technical aids to doing it. And I've been interested for a while in wondering whether there was a way of creating software that would help with lyric writing. I've been working on this project. And are the results of this research evident on this new album? Not much, no. The, the lyric generator, as I call it, is still rather a long way from fruition. It turns out that writing lyrics is a very sophisticated job. I've noticed the way most songwriters write their lyrics. Most of them do what I do, which is they have prepared a piece of music, they've got a piece of music underway, and they start scat singing. Don't sing my air, wake up off a different Something that sort of sounds like words, but isn't. But it, has, it carries the rhythm you want, the sort of phonetic content you want, the melodic content, the style of singing. It's got all of those things except meaning. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if you could somehow present that to a piece of software that would say, okay, well, that sounds like this. And it would deliver you a bundle of words which fit precisely to the sort of phonetic and uh, rhythmic structure of what you're doing. And you could say, well, hmm, that bit's good. That bit's not so good, but let's save that bit and try it again. <laughs> well, it's quite difficult. That's not an easy problem to solve. So if any of your listeners would like to help me on this... <laughs> so how then do you write most of the... How have you written most of the lyrics? Well, what happens with lyrics, they, they go one of two ways for me. They either come very quickly and almost intact and this usually happens when I've started a piece of music and I really want to sing something on it and I just scribble something down very quickly um, just something to sing and I sing it and I think that's pretty good except that third line in that verse is rubbish so scribble that one out and sing it again and that's often the end of the lyric so so that process can take minutes and some of these songs took minutes to write, and some of them took years. <laughs> because if they don't occur like that, then they come with quite a lot of difficulty. So which was the hardest one on this album? The hardest one, or rather the one that took longest, was How Many Worlds. That took a very long time. There's very few words in that song, but I must have rewritten it 60 or 70 times and re-sang it at least 30 with different lyrics. In fact, Michel Faber, the writer, helped me with that. So he, he contributed some lyrics as well. <laughs> Two or three sets, as I remember. <laughs> Go. 
yours, there's another one new, another one new. How many people will we feed today? How many lips will we kiss today? trying in some way to make a more commercial album with this. Some of the songs are very catchy. Do you know, I have never ever tried to make a commercial album because I'm sure if I did it would be a complete flop. I, I have no sense of how to do that. In fact, whenever I work with other people, I often fix on one song and I say, this song is going to be a huge hit. And of course it never is. No, I just don't, I don't really have a good sense of what the world at large likes. Well, the world at large likes songs, for a start. Yes, yes. No, I, I know they like that, but which ones is beyond me. Mm. Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't often relate to what, to what I would choose, with exceptions. For instance, when I, when I heard Never Ever by All Saints, I knew immediately that was going to be a huge hit. And there are a few other examples of that, but but often things become hits and it's a complete mystery to me why they have done. What about melody? How do the, how do you, where does melody come into the um, equation here? It's very intuitive. It's one of the most intuitive parts of what I do in that I just know a good one when I hear it. Or rather, I know it from how it feels when I sing it. For instance, some melodies actually are so moving that tears come to my eyes. It doesn't mean they're moving because they're sad but just because they grab something and they they really pull it hard and the moment i'm singing it i can feel my eyes filling with tears and i think that's probably a good one <laughs> and which are there any melodies that did that on this album how many worlds that melody actually it was like that under oh yes well yes because under is an old song was recycled. that from my scratchy life it was a song that i recorded um 14 or 15 years ago and it was yes it was from a, a record that was never released actually there were a few good songs on that record but i didn't release it because the record company wouldn't release it in a when timely they said fashion. they would yeah they promised a release date and then they went back on their promise so i said well i'm not releasing it <laughs> <laughs> but you rescued that track for, for this album yeah why i just happened to listen to it one day and i thought that sounds like now to me. It sounds like something I would do now. And originally I thought of doing a, a new version of it. But this version has one of the world's greatest drummers on. So I thought, why do anything else? Who is, who's that? Willie Green from, of the Neville Brothers. He was working with the Nevilles when I, when I met him. And that drum performance is so random, actually, that... It, it has such a, a different spirit from most drum performances. I built the song around the drum performance. That was the first thing that happened. The song came after that. Are there any other instrumental performances by um, other musicians on this album? Yes, there's a guitarist called Leo Abrahams who's on five tracks here, I think. But mostly this album was recorded by you on your own in your little studio in the Music West Yes, London. that's right. And over quite a long period as well. I mean, the oldest track, well, apart from Under, which is quite old, Bottom Liners, I recorded in 1998. So they've covered quite a long period here. We shouldn't run away with the idea that this is an unrecognisably Eno record just because it's got melodies and vocals. <laughs> on. I mean, there is lots of your signature kind of wonderfully floaty, presumably analogue synthesizer sounds on it. Do you know what? There's not a single analog synthesizer on here. <laughs> Why? I'm not sentimental about them. I think I know what makes analog synthesizers sound good. And I think I can easily replicate it. 
with digital synthesizers, there's, there's quite a lot of analog treatment of sounds. So sounds running through various devices I've collected that modify the sound. And quite often that's, well, not quite often, but sometimes that's analog. But um, I'm not such a big analog buff myself. I suppose I should have guessed since analog has become so intensely fashionable, it would be uh, <laughs> something that you would at this point fight shy of. But I do remember you, I do in the past you've been quite, you, were, and you hung on to your old analog synthesizers. Yes. When, after digital first came in. Yes. Actually, one of the reasons for that was, probably the main reason was because I had a good rapport with them. And the rapport you have with an instrument is actually the most important thing. The instrument, I mean, think of the violin. What a ridiculously limited instrument it is. But it just so happens that people have great rapport with it. So people can do things with violins that are very interesting. But actually, if somebody came up with that design now and said, look, I've thought of this new instrument, I'm going to call it a violin. It's got four strings that sound very sort of squeaky. <laughs> and you play it with this horse's tail. Um, you know, people would laugh them off, off stage, wouldn't they? It's so just, it's only, it's only because it has this great conversation that's gone on around it for so long. So which instruments do you have a particularly good rapport with, as evidenced on this record? Quite a lot of stuff on this record comes out of the following instruments. There's Native Instruments FM7, which is a software synth, which is sort of based on the principles of the DX7, so frequency modulation and uh, that kind of synthesis which I have a good understanding of because I worked with the DX7 for so long then I'm using a VS, a Prophet VS which is an interesting synthesizer because it's one of the first that use randomness which I had always thought would be a good idea in synthesizers so the VS has a little trick that you can do where it will generate a random voice so it would just scramble the parameters in the synthesizer to come up with a new voice. And some of those are very, very beautiful and interesting. And you can further modify them to suit your purposes. I use guitar a lot on here. It's usually a guitar going through quite a lot of other stuff. <laughs> I use voice a lot, actually, as an instrument. So, so there are very often things in here that sound like instruments that are actually vocal, treated vocal. There are things on here that happened quite quickly, and I thought, that's good, I'm going to leave it alone, I'm never going to listen to it again until it's out on a record. <laughs> this is like the first song, I did that very, very quickly. I started at about 10 o'clock one morning and finished about 8 in the evening. And that was writing, recording, everything. the whole process? It started from nothing, and ended up 10 hours later as that, as this. <laughs> and the demonstrative pronoun? Oh, well, funnily enough, this is all based around a loop. So I, I had done a, one of my text pieces, and I'd made a little mix of it. It was on a CD. And then I was playing around with that CD in my... I've got all this DJ equipment that DJs use where you can make loops and trap things and affect the sound. And that's what I was doing. And that little loop came up. I thought, I like that. I just let it run for a few minutes. So I had about four minutes of that little part. And then I just started working on top of it. It just had this single word, this. I thought, what an intriguing idea. And of course, list songs are very easy to write. This A, this B, this C, this D. <laughs> I, what I like about it is it, it actually taps in, in a, what I would think of as quite an enormous way, into the, the idea of pop immediacy. This. I mean, it's the... Yes. Here and now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my, this 
bell this calling this burden this falling the world turning this is what I thought I knew this is what I thought was true this I understood this in the deep wood this are there I stood a child so On a certain square, this down the dirty stairs, this to see the table set, this with golden chairs, this hard to follow, 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 follow them. This from Brian Eno's excellent new album, Another Day on Earth, which concludes our interview with him, conducted in the conservatory of his wonderful new house in the Oxfordshire countryside. Not bad for ten hours' work, that. Now, here is a block. And we leave you tonight with something really special. This is the radio premiere of another of Brian Eno's spoken word pieces. It's unreleased, it's not on his new album, and it's based upon his intercutting of two texts. One, a description of a torture scene in a Bosnian prison camp. The other, an autobiographical account by a stripper of the sort of thing she had to say to turn her customers on. Eno felt that these two accounts sounded strikingly similar, so he edited them together and asked his Polish bookkeeper to read them. The result is a fascinating track called Warnography. We're back next week with an all CD edition. Until then, good night. Good night. No longer made of blood, hell, far from here. In such emptiness, pearls. Inserted into a last sleeping space, which last sleeping space, three middle aged men made of blood do that inside there. Perfect location inside there, stone made of blood. Pearls in such emptiness. In such emptiness.
not eating it, including pimps, this place not far from here always open. by Brian Eno, ending tonight's Mixing It, which was presented by Mark Russell and Robert Sandel, and the producer was Felix.